Okay, welcome everyone to another micro seminar. Before I begin and introduce our speaker, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that micro seminars took a break for the past few weeks. We felt this was appropriate given the protests sparked by the killing of George Floyd and in solidarity with the Black Lives Matter movement and to demonstrate our own frustration with racial injustice, uh, especially in the US. During this time, we've been able to reflect on the diversity represented by the micro seminars, and we think we can do more uh, to represent people from diverse backgrounds through the micro seminar speaker and host pool. We'll continue to reflect on the best way to increase the diversity of the micro seminar. But in the meantime, if you're interested in getting involved with the micro seminar as a speaker or a host, please sign up through our website, which is microseminar.wordpress.com, uh, the ISME Go Viral webpage, or you can send us an email at microbiologyseminar, um, that's all one word, at gmail.com. And we're really interested in um, Black, Indigenous, and people of color scientists joining our hosting team or our speaker pool. Okay, so it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today's seminar, uh, Thomas Hackel. Thomas got his PhD at the University of Würzburg in Germany, and he is currently a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute for Medical Research um, in Germany, but he's taking advantage of this situation, uh, living in the Netherlands and working remotely. And he also did a postdoc at Massachusetts Institute of Technology in the US, uh, working with Penny Chisholm. And today, uh, Tomas will be talking about mobile elements, abundant in marine vesicles, shape prochlorococcus genomic plasticity. Um, okay, take it away, Tomas, and thank you for your seminar. Okay, trying to share my screen. Can you see it? Looks good, yep. Perfect. PowerPoint, yep. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. Thanks for the introduction. Um, and thank you for having me and giving me the chance to talk about my research. Um, as you mentioned before, I did a postdoc at MIT, and this will actually cover a lot of the work I did there from actually Penny Chisholm's lab. So we're gonna talk about a bug called Prochlorococcus, uh, a tiny marine microbe that's really important for especially open ocean ecology. Um, and I did a lot of genomics work on, on, on these uh, bacteria. And I wanna show you a few interesting things that I think we found in my time in the lab. Um, if you talk about Prochlorococcus, there's pretty easy to characterize in a few words, I think. It's, it's super tiny, it's green, and it's lastly abundant. So it's a cyanobacterium that's only about 5.5 micrometers in diameter. And it has a really small genome, roughly about two megabase pairs in size. But there's three, to the ten, uh, three times 10 to the 27 million cells in the ocean. So that makes it probably the most abundant photosynthetic organism on the entire planet. And it's responsible for about 5% of global primary productivity. So it's really important for um, uh, fueling the food web in the marine ecosystems, especially in the open oceans away from the coasts where there's low nutrients. Um, and just to illustrate like the abundance and also the global scale of these organisms, um, this is a, a projection or an estimation of, of abundance of these cells uh, across global oceans. And you can see it kind of goes along the tropical regions and branches up and down into subtropical regions, almost close to the polar circles, but then gets too cold for these guys to really thrive. Um, the word of Prochlorococcus is pretty interesting to think about because it's very different from that of bacteria we usually think tend to think about. For me, most bacteria is what we call have in the lab, like E. coli. You grow them in biofilms; they really live closely together in colonies, so it's like cell-cell interactions. A lot of that. For Prochlorococcus, the word is pretty different because it swims in the open in this very dilute environment, um, and it's really very, very far away, especially if you compare it to its own size from everything else around it, from other cells, from other organisms. Um, and this figure is, illustrates it, I think, quite nicely. So you can actually see that from one cell to another, there's like 200 cells distances. And even if you think about nutrients that they need to, you would think on a daily basis in a 
in a continuous manner, um, you can break that down into cell distances. So they only run into ion like every other in, in, in distances like this in a single ion molecule. So they run into ion molecules, a single molecule at a time. And you need to adapt to these very oligotrophic, is very nutrient poor um, and, and interaction poor environments. And so this is a very different ecology from, from our lab box that we often use um, to work with. And there's two other entities in this in this uh, environment that I'd like to point, point right to out right now because they're going to be more interesting in the rest of the talk for us. One is phages, which are highly abundant viral particles in the ocean. A lot of them prey on prokaryococcus and have an important role in like driving the dynamics of, of uh, bringing up and down prokaryococcus cell count numbers. And the other ones are vesicles. Vesicles are small lipid enclosed particles that are usually butted off by cells. Um, in prokaryococcus, as most other marine bacteria and archaea that we know of, produces these vesicles on a regular basis. They seem to have a lot of different functions and nobody's really clear on, on what they in, in general do and probably do a lot of different things in different, different circumstances. Um, but there's a lot of interesting ongoing research on what their function actually is and what they are really important for. Um, Interestingly, they're about as abundant almost in some places as phages. So they're much more abundant in cells. And if you think again about like running into each other, prokaryococcus is much more likely to run into a phage or a vesicle than it's to run into another, another cell which it can interact with. And that's going to become interesting in like thinking about evolution and gene exchange, for example, of these guys. Um, when we look at prokaryococcus from a genomics perspective, so think about its genomes, um, I got the the luxury to work with a really extensive data set. So over the last couple of years, um, Penny Jism's group had acquired um, 600, over 600 genomes of prokaryococcus sample all across the oceans. So most of them from like sites in Hawaii and, 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 and the Atlantic close to uh, station Bermuda, but also we have a lot of samples from all over the globe. Um, many of these genomes were obtained from single cell isolates. Um, and I was able to look at those and figure out sort of like, how does the, the global collective genome look like if you take these 600 cells together? Um, prokaryococcus forms these different groups within its phylogeny. It's kind of represented here in the tree, but it's not really important for the, the talk. I just wanted to show you that it's uh, how did the general structure of the, the organism looks like, the taxonomy. And what is interesting is that this taxonomy going from up down also matches how they are distributed in the water columns. So you have highlight adapted prokaryococcus, highlight clades in the higher uh, regions of the oceans and in the, in the surface layers, five meters, 10 meters, 50 meters depth. And the deeper you go, they also usually you go down in this uh, taxonomy, you go to low light clades that are better adapted to living at lower light levels. Um, interestingly, prokaryococcus, if you compare all these genomes, you find that it has a big, very big pan genome. So that means every cell shares only a, a finite set of genes with all other cells. This is the core genome. It's around a thousand genes or a little more. But then you have a lot of genes that are only found in some of these clades. And some of them are just randomly found in individual cells. You don't see them as a second time or you only see them in a handful of other cells, but in the rest of the 600, they're not present. So these would be as flexible genes. Um, and they usually thought of like, they drive local adaptation. They're accessory genes that help you to, your, to adapt to your, like, really like your local environment versus the core genes. They maintain your, your basic functions of the cells. Um, and it's interesting if you just make a projection of based on all the cells that we saw and what we would expect if you sequence and sequence and sequence until we, we've basically seen everything, we would expect there to be at least 80,000 different genes in prokaryococcus. So it's a really big pan genome in that sense, but it also fits the, the large uh, overall population size. The question that kind of drove me in all of this is how is this maintained, this organism? Like how is this large pan genome? How does it fit together with the large population size, but then rare interactions um, and pr possibly also little horizontal gene transfer? How is it all connected? So let's start with what we know already. Um, it's been already shown that in prokaryococcus, flexible genes, like in many other bacteria, are organized in what we call genomic islands. Um, and in this case, these were fi finite regions in the genome 
Here they first illustrated in 2006 by comparing two different prokaryotic strains. And they had these regions here and here and here and here that were enriched in flexible genes. So genes that were only present in a few strains within the population, but not within every cell. Whereas the, the other parts here in between, they were more likely to be found in almost all the prokaryotic cells they saw out in the oceans. Um, and these uh, particular regions, they tend to be in, also enriched in these genes that we would expect to be accessory genes, auxiliary metabolic genes, genes that help them for, to acquire nutrients, um, and genes that are used in evading phages or other predators. Um, but you then can put this into context with how prokaryotic can actually engage in horizontal genes, for instance, because the idea is if you have a few genes that you can swap in and out, you have to exchange them, right? You have to get them from somewhere. Interestingly, prokaryotic doesn't really engage in transformation. People have looked at that in the lab for years and years and years and actually burned a few PhD students, I think. Doesn't really work. Um, the other way is conjugation, pretty well known from other organisms. We lack all the gene contents that we would have to need to, to make these structures and we've never seen anything like that in any of the cultures or in any of the genomes. Um, also, we do not have prophages. There's a single report of a partial prophage in one genome, that's it. We do not have plasmids. We don't have any of these common mobile genetic elements that we see in, in other bacteria a lot. We don't have IAs, so gene, uh, gene transfer agents, things like that. We don't even have a CRISPR system, which is also kind of rare. Um, which essentially only leaves one mechanism as the one that you could think would drive gene transfer and prokaryotic, and that would be transduction. Uh, transduction means that you take a piece of host DNA during a phage infection, you encapsulate it somehow in a phage particle, and that phage particle then transports it to another cell where it gets incorporated in the genome. So you have a phage as a vector for horizontal gene transfer. Question is, is that enough to drive the system? Is it specific enough? Is this abundant enough? I don't know. That's what, what drove me and I wanted to look into that more closely. Um, yeah, that's again the question. So what drives horizontal gene transfer of prokaryotic? What drives the island of these genomic uh, islands where all these genes are concentrated? Um, and I started out looking at these islands from the perspective that was to me uh, most easily approachable in this case, because I had all these different genomes. Uh, I didn't have to do metagenomics or anything like it. I could actually just go and take the 600 genomes and ask at every location, at every gene along a genome, how often do I see that gene in my collection of 600? Um, and then you can get a very clear picture of where your islands are. So you see a, a, a subsets of genes that are pretty much present in around 450. That's equivalent to the overall completeness of our genomes that we had. So these are our core genes and the core region. And then you find these regions in between where you have a lot of these blue genes that are much less abundant. These would correspond to genomic islands. So you have the clustering and the enrichment of these flexible genes in the genomic islands and your core genome in between. Um, and then using these genomic islands, we could start asking them and look at them in more details. So we go from the core genes to the flexible genes. And we can actually not only look at one genome as people have mostly done in the past, but we can do this alignment basically across all our genomes. And this is again, just a subset, but we can see that here, every gray line, every bar corresponds to a genomic island. And they always sit in a pretty much the same location if you look at closely related uh, strains and then you just as another clay deeper down in the tree but again within the clay they're pretty similar and there's some differences between, between the clades but they correspond to well-known genome rearrangement and it appear, apparently happened uh, sometimes in back in the lineage when the new uh, clades emerge. What was really interesting in addition to this picture of, of where, where that these islands are in these very conserved and centennial locations um, is that they were all formed next to, or almost all of them formed to next to seven tRNA genes. So these are these small triangles here, different color means a different tRNA gene. Um, and you can see uh, almost all of them abut one of these islands. Um, and that's a really interesting telltale. So usually genomic islands, um, the way that people often consider them in, in, in many bacteria, and it's been shown that that's the process that drives their formation and their um, and, and how they move around is 
that it's homologous recombination of flanking regions. So you have a, a fragment from one bacterium that's going to a very closely related strain. Um, the flanking parts of that fragment are similar to something that's in the, in the recipient strain and something in between is different, but it recombines and kind of splits out the, the middle part of, the, of this region. And that kind of is the genomic island. Um, that doesn't need any tRNAs or anything like that, but it also creates a much more diffuse pattern because you can have multiple places being part in this exchange. In prokaryotic carcass, we get these very finite locations where something happens and always happens at tRNAs. And, and that's a really interesting telltale because tRNAs actually uh, are known to be integration sites for mobile genetic elements such as phages um, that have specific genes that target these, into, uh, these tRNAs as attachment sites and then splice in uh, incoming DNA. So I also looked at recombination rate just to be sure here at the, at the sites of these uh, genomic guys and I couldn't see any signal of homogous recombination being important for deformation. So there were no increased recombination rates, but we did see all of these uh, tRNAs. So I started looking more closely at this island at the tRNAs and, and looking actually for integrase genes because that's what you would expect and what you would need to insert something into an extra tRNA. And that was actually pretty uh, cool because we found a lot. Um, we found over 900 elements, mobile genetic elements, all of them sitting usually right next to one of these tRNA genes in one of these islands. So every of these rectangles or diamonds here is, an, is a genomic or is a genetic mobile genetic element. Um, and it has an integrase, so a gene that, or something that resembles homolog to a known integrase, and it's likely to integrate ne uh, or into it or next to a tRNA gene. Um, and we can already say from this now that we have this, these site-specific integrases in prokaryococcus in these mobile genetic elements that target specific tRNAs, only the seven, not others. So there's, mm, now I'm blanking on the number, but there's a lot of tRNAs for all of the different amino acids um, and all the different codons, more, much more than seven, but only these seven seem to be relevant to the system of integrative elements. And these elements uh, integrate next to these tRNAs. But what is interesting, if you look at the pattern, you see it's very patchy. So if you can go from one strain to the next, there can be an element and then it's gone, it's gone, it's gone. And then there's another element uh, in another strain. And then again, it's gone and the, another one, a new element. Almost all of these elements are unique. So they're not the same element coming in and out, um, but they're very different on a nucleotide or a protein level. Um, so that, to me, that suggests that these elements come in, but also quickly disappear again. So it must be a very dynamic system. In evolutionary timescales, often you don't even see an element at all next to tRNA. Just sometimes as a snapshot, you capture an element sitting there, but by the time you look again, it might have already been gone. So essentially this establishes that we have these mobile elements that are kind of like these visitors of these larger islands. Next to the tRNA, they come in and um, Sometimes they stay around for a while, but then they can also disappear again from the genomes. Um, as I already mentioned, kind of these elements have a integrase gene, and this is actually the typical structure that they have. So they sit next to tRNA gene. They have an integrase gene that's usually right next to the tRNA gene. Then they kind of carry a bunch of cargo genes, and we talk about that a little bit more in a bit. And they usually have an operon that kind of facilitates probably some form of replication mechanism. So it's like helicases, uh, polymerases, genes like that. We don't really know. It's a very diverse group and we haven't looked explicitly at the function, but they're very much related to replicative operons and other mobile genetic elements. Um, the way that the integration itself works is usually, we thought at least in the beginning, it's probably a circular um, element, although we now have evidence that that might not be the case at all, but you have the integrase gene, which a part of a tRNA on a mobile genetic element. The integrase gene, when it enters a cell, is expressed, you get a protein, that protein binds to the partial tRNA, the attachment site, both in the incoming DNA fragment and in the host genome. And then they form a complex that essentially splices the mobile element into the host genome. And this is the situation that in the end that we actually ca kept, capture in the single cell genomes, right? So we capture that integrated element at some point. Um, what is really cool is when we started looking at the integrases, um, 
also those were a lot more complex than we initially thought. So this is a tree that just covers pretty much all of the integrases that we know, tyrosine-like integrases. This is from a review paper, based on a review paper. And it covers integrases from phages, from mobile elements, from all kinds of things that go in and out of the genomes. And I would have expected ours to kind of pop up somewhere in there, because that's usually what happens. But instead, what we found is that we actually get an, our own sort of unique branch. So all our integrases, or almost all of them, fall into this additional colored clade here with a few subclades. Um, and they make up quite a bit of, like, if you just compare how diverse these families here are that cover different uh, bacterial domains, um, just what we see in Prochorococcus in the single group of a single genus, a single group of bacteria, that also is almost as uh, diverse as some of these clays we have that cover much more uh, different genera. Um, and the integrases, we can actually even match different clades to the specific tRNA that they target. So every integrase that's on here usually integrates right next to a proline. Um, any every interest in this yellow clay then integrates here next to a threonine. So even the, the location where the integrase integrates the mobile element into is already encoded in its in its uh, yeah in its sequence and its evolution. Um, so we get this really nice uh, system, right? You have an integrate, you have a different integrator, then you can actually open up a, a an island, a drawer where you can put in your integrase, and, and it's kind of like this neat system. Um, with that, obviously, what was really interesting, what are these elements carrying and, and what are their actual functions? Um, and we stumbled upon two very interesting different kind of types of elements. So the first one, um, they're really cool. They, they resemble something that's called a, a phage-inducible chromosomal island. They have this, the, the typical structure. They have an integrase at the start next to a tRNA. They have a replication module at the end. But then they carry one or two uh, very characteristic genes, either a major capsid protein or a small terminase subunit. Both of these genes encode proteins that are required in phages for packaging. So the capsid proteins builds the capsid or is part of the G proteins that make the capsid. The terminase is part of a complex that takes the DNA and pumps it into a capsid once it's assembled. Um, and we were wondering like, why, what are they doing on these mobile elements? Um, and in literature, actually this a similar system has already been described. It's called these phage induced chromosomal islands. And we know from those is that these elements actually they sit in the host genome. Once a phage attacks the cell, they reactivate. And then they interfere with the phage replication. And essentially what they do is they use these proteins that they have, either a major capsid protein or the terminase, to uh, hijack the phage capsid that are produced by the infecting phage. So with a major capsid protein, what you get is a hybrid capsid that's usually smaller than the actual phage capsid. And it, get, it packages only the mobile genetic element instead of the full length phage genome because it doesn't fit in that capsid. Or you have the terminase, which is kind of exclusively only packages mobile genetic elements that had also replicated during the phage replication cycle in the cell into new pack and new phage capsids instead of phage genomes. So in that way, these elements are able to actively inject themselves or hijack the phage capsids of an infecting phage and make uh, get into their own vectors to be disseminated in other cells. And this is advantageous for the element because it gets moved around, but it's also advantageous for the host because it takes away resources from the phage. Depending on how this competition works, it can even lead to no infecting phages being produced by a cell that contains such an element and only phage capsids coming out of it that actually contain these mobile elements. So it kind of stops the spread of an infection and it even disseminates this form of defense mechanism to nearby cells. Um, we couldn't really show this in the lab yet because we have ongoing experiments. What we could show and what is kind of makes me think that we're really on the right track is I looked at viral fraction metagenomes, so metagenomic data obtained from capsids. Um, and there we found a bunch of these elements, both in Tara metagenomes, but also in viral fractions that we sequence with nanopores. So there we got full length elements being super abundant in, in viral capsids. Um, just proving that, or proving, but putting, giving a lot of good evidence that the idea of these being packaged in phage capsid is a, 
is pretty much what's happening out there. Um, in addition to these elements that contain these phage packaging genes, we found actually much more that don't have any phage related genes. Um, and they were actually much simpler in structure. They contain an integrase usually, they have a small replication like operon. And then they often just contain a single operon that somehow, uh, in this case, I picked the nicest example, but they can actually have complete metabolic traits. This is my favorite example. This guy complete, it contains a complete operon that you need to assimilate nitrate. Prokaryococcus usually can only live on of ammonia as a nitrogen source in the ocean. If a prokaryococcus cell were to acquire this guy, and we have one in culture that has, uh, it's able to live on nitrate as an additional nitrogen source. So it's a huge advantage under certain conditions when ammonia is scarce and nitrate is abundant um, in a competitive environment, obviously. Um, and we not only have nitrate, we have uh, here siderophores. These are used to import iron. So I said iron is one of the scarcest resources out there in the ocean. So having this operon gives you an edge uh, if you want to acquire iron. We have uh, operons that are important for phosphate, uh, and which is another super scarce resource. And we have even some items, uh, some things that have something like maybe phage defense, that this could be a restriction, nucleation, uh, restriction uh, modification system. Um, but so on the one hand, we have these interesting, really interesting elements with like, but apparently very useful um, cassette gene cassettes that can be, it almost looks like plug and play put into a cell and help the cell adapt to a, uh, uh, look, uh, to, to a local environment and then even be get rid of once it's not useful anymore. But on the other hand, we don't have uh, a way of how we can think these elements could be propagated. So for the ones with the phage package, it's clear they jump into a phage and go to the next cell. But how can these be disseminated, especially given that prokaryococcus seems not to engage in conjugation or transformation? Um, and so we also had another question that I tried to follow up on and, and we kind of spun ideas. Um, uh, I'm now actually getting ahead of myself, I'm sorry. Um, okay, take the thought put it in the back of your head. We're gonna come back to that in a few slides. Before going there, I'm actually gonna go and talk a little bit more of this guy, this nitrous assimilation cluster. Um, Cause as I said, we actually have this one in culture. So most of these are from single cell genomes in the ocean. We can't really do experiments on those, but this nitrate uh, operon that sits in one of our cultures. Um, and we could ask, we could use that to ask one important questions how is, the, how is the genomic island, this larger part of selective genes connected to these elements? Because they often only make up part of the islands. Um, and in this case, when we look at the genome of this particular guy, um, this is the genome, all the gray bars are genomic islands and all the green things are genomic elements. So it has five mobile genetic elements, two times, it has this nitric cost that's actually duplicated and it sits in two different genomic islands, always next to a gRNA gene. Um, it's actually not true, actually only one time next to a gRNA gene. Um, and we sequenced this strain in 2011 after it was isolated from the oceans. And now we went and resequenced that culture using nanopores. So, because we were interested in, do we see any structural changes in the genome just based on the presence of these elements, maybe just the loss of the element or, or some form of dynamic. Um, and that was actually really informative. So we started out and we had this original population that we already knew from our initial 2011 sequencing. And we recaptured that from the nanopore sequencing. So we get nanopore reads that corroborate all these integrations as we expected them for the, from the original strain. But we get a heterogeneous mix. So we get subpopulations that look different. First off, we see some that have lost one of the two copies. And that often usually coincides with inversion of this entire chromosomal fragment. So the entire part between these two duplicated elements has uh, flipped. And in this process, one of the elements got lost. Um, that's kind of like a typical thing that uh, in, in genomic rearrangement that that can happen. So this is not unusual and kind of expected, but it's really nice to see it happen in this very short time frame in our culture in the lab. In addition, we also saw that one of the elements jumped to a different location, again, a genomic island. Um, and again, 
based on this pattern, we saw different versions of inversions on deletions from these this two copy states in a different island. So we get multiple populations, all of them having the same element sitting in one or two places with genomic rearrangements. That already tells you how much of dynamics of genome dynamics and and and, and um, yeah, kind of how 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 important to genome evolution just the presence and the activity of these elements can be. And we can even zoom in and see some more effects. So if you just zoom in into one island, this one here, here the element sits next to a tRNA proline, and this is actually also the place you would expect it based on the integrase. So this integrase targets a proline, and this is where the element sits. But we see that throughout the islands, we have partial fragments of tRNA proline's um, that have probably been uh, there or have been created by previous integration of other elements and then partial or imprecise excisions. And this is also something that you see a lot in genomic islands that you have a multiplication of, of, of partial tRNAs. And if we look at those, we can actually see that sometimes this element not only jumps um, into these other islands I've told you before, but it, it does kind of short jumps, micro jumps within the genomic islands to so other of these partial proline tRNAs. And we also see some of these parts between the partial tRNAs jump around. So the integrase on this element cannot only mobilize the element, but it can mobilize everything that's kind of flanked by something that looks like a partial proline tRNA. Again, just adding a layer of, 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 of uh, mobility and, and of, of things that can happen in these islands just because of the presence of these mobile genomic elements. Um, and now we're sort of back to the question I asked before. So, okay, we have them, these elements. Um, they seem to be really, or potentially be important to evolution and, and can change a lot and rapidly, but how can they be transferred between cells? Um, and this is when we turn to one entity that I also mentioned already in the introduction, this is vesicles. We know from lab experiments and also from the environment that Prochorococcus produces a lot of these vesicles um, and that they're more abundant in cells in the ocean. And it's been long been hypothesized that they might have been an important role in horizontal gene transfer because they would be ideal vectors, right? They, they're highly abundant, they can protect DNA, um, they could potentially have a broad host range and they could be taken up by other cells uh, discriminately or indiscriminately, whatever, they could be recognized, even you could do some kind of kin selection or whatever. So it would be really nice, but nobody has been able to really show that they're efficient vectors for gene transfer. Um, fortunately, Somebody in our labs is Steve Biller. He already thought about that. And a few years back, he went out and he got metagenomes from vesicles. Um, so he extracted DNA from vesicles and then sequenced that in a Illumina sequencer. And at the time, he was already trying to ascertain what is moved around in vesicles. His picture at the time, he could only sort of say, well, it's pretty random. So almost all of the things at some point end up, but only in small fragments in vesicles from the genome. It wasn't a clear picture. Now we had the advantage, we kind of knew what we were looking for. Um, I reanalyzed this data set and I asked specifically, do we see these elements in these vesicles? He only at the time had a handful of prokaryocarcus genomes to compare to, so he didn't know about the elements. And if even if he had known, he had only seen 10 or so in some of the genomes he had. But now I had these thousands, thousands of elements uh, capturing a lot of the diversity out there and I could ask the question again. Um, and the way I did this is in this hopefully then plot that I, you can understand once I explain it a little bit. I counted how often do I see a certain gene in the cellular fraction. That's actually this axis. Uh, um, and on the y-axis, how often do I see it in, uh, in uh, vesicle fractions? So the, the genes that are plotted here, every dot is a gene in prokaryocarcus. These are all core genes. Um, and you can see that there's a straight line um, that kind of forms that, that that's supposedly stuff that randomly gets into vesicles is about as abundant in vesicles as it's in cells. Anything that would be enriched in a vesicle, that will be expect in this upper right quadrant, the uh, upper left quadrant of the plot. And then if you look at the hallmark genes of the elements, we actually, oops, sorry, we actually see them, this is where they end up. So they're much more abundant in vesicles compared to core genes um, than they are in cells. Um, and this is not only true, we have, we've looked at different stations and we can see the same picture pretty clearly everywhere. So almost all of the mobile element genes uh, are more abundant. They, they seem to be replicated somehow and exported into vesicles. 
Um, this is about as far as we can go right now. We can't really prove that they are transferred to other cells, but they seem to be enriched in the vesicles. A big hint that this is how they get propagated between cells. We also don't know when this happens or what induces it, um, but we do have an additional kind of hint that helps us understand this scenario and also kind of helps us pinpoint it to the, the activity of the integrases. So we cannot only look at the genes, but I actually specifically also looked at the presence of the tRNA genes. Um, the integrase always only targets half of the tRNA. So if you have a complete tRNA in the host genome and you bought off kind of or generate a mobile genetic element, that only carries one of the halves. If you have multiple copies, one of the half of the tRNAs is much more abundant than the other half. And if you do that math sort of on our vesicle metagenomes, we see a picture. Mm, everything that's in the center means it's about both halves of the tRNA are about as abundant as the other one. Everything that's left or right, one half is more abundant. And everything to shift is up, it's generally more abundant than other tRNAs. And everything that colors are the seven tRNAs that I said are targeted by the integrases. And then if you look across the four samples, we can clearly see the one that the few tRNAs that get clearly jump out are those that are targeted by the integrases. So for those, one of the halves is much more abundant in the vesicles than the other one. Um, and they're in general more abundant in other tRNAs, again, suggesting that there's an active sort of mechanism putting them into vesicles. Interestingly, there's a few other tRNAs that show similar behavior that haven't come up in prokaryococcus. Um, but this is actually not a prokaryococcus specific set. So this actually could just include other bacteria that have different integrases. Um, and it's actually also something we see when we look at other genomes, now that we kind of have an idea of how these elements look like. They're actually not only present in prokaryococcus, they're the most abundant. Um, but I can see different elements that are very similar to mine in pretty much all of the uh, different uh, classes of bacteria that, that they're out there in the oceans with prokaryococcus. So suggesting that this is not just a prokaryococcus specific set. Okay, I think this uh, pretty much concludes the story for today that I hope I could convince you that this is really interesting system in prokaryococcus um, of mobile elements that appear to be very important for the genomic plasticity. Um, the elements themselves, they can integrate the tRNAs. Um, they themselves can transport important cargo, but they also seem to change the, 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 the islands next to it. Um, and likely, this, I haven't covered this in this talk, but we're now getting more and more evidence that they are also very important for actually making up the parts next to the elements. So like phages, they can bring in uh, additional material if they get excised from the host. They take with them fragments that are next to them, put them into new hosts, where they then are left behind. So they seem to not only exchange themselves, but by going in and out, they also bring in other stuff and remodel the islands next to them. There's two kind of different functional types. We have these phage parasites, which is very interesting. Um, on behalf of these, these, these carriers of genomic cargo um, with these really in, uh, function with these uh, really important ecological functions, mostly for nutrient acquisition. They make a lot of sense in, in, in the environment of prokaryococcus. Um, we see that these elements are abundant in viral capsids. Not surprising, these are probably the phage uh, parasites, but also we see a lot of them abundant in vesicles, um, hinting that vesicles might be an important route for horizontal transfer of these elements between these different cells. Um, and it also nice to notice that compared to a lot of other mobile elements that have been studied and, 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 and that are much more popular, like these ice integrative conjugative elements, for example. Um, the elements that we're talking here, they're, they're very minimal in the design. They only have a, like a single integrase and then a handful of genes for, for replication. The rest is dedicated to targo, cargo. Uh, other mobile elements, um, they often carry their own complex uh, propagation machinery, like the, the ice elements that um, 
have genes for making conjugation with other cells. That makes them easier to find. It's probably why we've also overlooked these elements for a long time. Um, but it's also kind of, this is neat because it fits with the entire idea of Prokaryococcus being super minimalistic and having these, these, these reduced genomes out there in the open ocean where there's very little uh, resources. So I, I think it's really nice to see that they also have a very minimalistic uh, set of mobile genetic elements that helps them keep up horizontal gene transfer probably under in this, in this, in this very diffuse uh, and dilute environment. Um, yeah, and that's pretty much it. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'm very much I'm very much looking forward to questions if you have any. Thank you. Yay! Thank you. All right, that was wonderful. Um, I was at MIT for a while, and I kept up a little bit with the Prochlorococcus genome stuff for a little while, but. Since leaving there, I have lost my, my uh, update, regular updates through their seminars. So this is a great um, the, you know, introduction to what's been happening over the past you know, five years since I left. So thank you very much for that. Um, so I had a question. Um, do you think uh, you, know, you had um, a lot of dynamics in the cultures, right? Where the mobile elements were moving a lot but you really don't see that dynamics in the environment. So it kind of suggests to me quite a bit of selection for the specific structure that they see in the environment. Would you agree with that? Or do you think there's another mechanism kind of keeping the genome arrangement as it is in so many of those um, environmental genomes? Um, yeah, yeah, it's a really good observation. So I think there's multiple facets to that. Um, you're right in terms of the genome organization. We saw that inversion, um, which we don't typically see in our environmental genomes. Um, but that has to be taken with some limitations. All of Most of the environmental genomes we have are single cell genomes, so we couldn't assemble it into a single contig. Um, they're just small fragments, and we arrange them essentially based on reference genomes. Mm -hmm. um, so larger genomic rearrangement could very well be hidden just because we can't see them with the way we sequence them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, but having said that, what is really specific about this lab strain is that it has these two identical copies of the same mobile genetic element. Um, and I think this A is rare and B, this is the main reason for the larger inversions. Um, for that to happen, you have to have an integration of that element, an off-target integration. Usually that integrates would always target the proline tRNA. In only very rare cases, it can apparently target a different tRNA that's very similar. It's kind of like a, a rare side effect. And that seems to be, have happened in that strain. Um, in addition, we kept that strain on nitrate. Mm -hmm. So we had in those lab selection for maintaining these copies because they would grow much faster than everybody in the same culture who would lose their copy. So we actually help like maybe keeping this probably in, 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 the, in the nature, this might be an unstable status with these two elements and uh, the inversion itself might be deleterious, um, but we kind of force them to maintain at least one copy by keeping them on nitrate. Mm -hmm. um, so again, yeah, that fits with what you say in nature, there's selection, in our case, we had a selection for seeing something like that in nature. All of them seem to be in under similar selection, giving the picture that we see, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Does that explain Great. something? Yeah, no, very helpful. Thanks, and thanks for your insight. Um, OK, so we have a couple questions here. Um, uh, Maya Breitbart uh, said, great seminar, Thomas. Two quick questions. What's the typical size range of the cargo, and how large can it be? Um, so the smallest ones are probably these uh, phage inducible like islands. They often just have a single gene, the major caps or two, three major caps of protein plus two tiny phage like genes. Um, so they would be just a couple of 20, uh, two, three KB long. And the longest one, so this one, the nitrogen one, uh, that is almost, I think, 16 or 17 KB. I mean, a few that we think might be longer, but at some point it gets hard to discern with like actually the boundary of the element. Um, and some of them just run out of context or so. Um, so we don't exactly know. Um, but I think that's the size range is between a few KB up to 20 KB roughly. Mm -hmm. Great. Um, and have you looked for these elements in other environments? Or do you think that it's uh, something that's 
ocean or aquatic specific adaptation? Um, that's a good question. I haven't looked at any terrestrial metagenomes or something like that for these elements. Um, but I also, it, it's it probably a little bit difficult to find and to immediately recognize them as being very similar um, because they are highly diverse. So the, these integrates, as I said, even within Procrocos already, they kind of branch off and make this group that looks very different from all our other integrates. In the beginning, we didn't even recognize that these were integrases, right? So when we did our initial genome annotations and you run your pipeline and you ask, are there integrases, which people often do because they were looking for prophages or anything, they didn't come up, so they didn't show up. Only after we had a couple of them as being potentially integrases and we started aligning them, then we saw that overall they must be integrases because then they form nice alignments with the rest of integrases. So if other organisms have similar systems, I would suspect they would be similarly diverse and therefore hard to detect in the first place and also difficult to kind of immediately recognize as being the same or being different. It's kind of very blurry at that point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I had another question too. I mean, it's it's really, really interesting that you found those tRNAs um, as part of it. And I think you mentioned that they were associated with other elements in, um, you know, in other systems, but not specifically vesicles, right? I mean, um, it, I'm just wondering what, this, what the, is the connection and is the tRNA specifically an important aspect of getting it into those vessels or do you think it's just somehow taking advantage of um you know just the repeated uh trnas within the system as an integration site i don't think that the trnas have anything to do with them being in vesicles could be but i, I yeah i to me, the tRNA is, 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 is the attachment site for the integrase. That's what is essential. Um, it's more conserved in other regions of the genome across all of Prochorococcus, for example. So it's a good target for the integrase. Um, you need to target something that whatever cell you get into, you, you need to find where you can integrate in the genome. If you're site specific, it has to be a somewhat conserved site. Um, tRNA is accessible. Um, so, and I mean, that's a common pattern, right? In, in, in mobile genetic elements and also in phages that their integrases target tRNAs. Uh, YD7, I don't know. Um, interestingly, most of them are more towards the center of the genomes so or further away from the terminus of replication. Um, so that might explain something because there's usually a bias towards putting genes that are less important further away from the terminus. So um, they might have some deleterious effect, which is, Kind of, kind of mitigated by them being further away from the terminus so where things are not as important. Um, something like that could play a role, but I don't, yeah, this is speculative. Uh, in terms of getting into the vesicles, I mean, for me, I, I'm still not, we have a bunch of hypotheses, but not really anything to go on on how they end up in vesicles. Um, my personal, one of the theories is that it's kind of like a random stochastic process. I could, for example, even see them ending up in vesicles during a phage uh, uh, infection. Because when the phage replicates, they might also reactivate similar to those parasite specific elements and they might replicate in the cytosol. And at some point when the cell bursts, you, even, you just get vesicles forming from the bursting cell automatically. You don't even have to do anything. And they might just grab parts of the genomic DNA that's still around. In this case, these might be replicated um, viruses. So that would be a very random stochastic process, a very passive, so to speak. Um, but there could be active ways of, they might even be butted off from, from living cells. We couldn't show that in the culture yet. But yeah, so there's a lot of work to do to, to really get down to the bottom of the mechanisms. Yeah, sure. That's uh, one of the things that keep us in business, isn't it? There's always more. <laughs> you always end up with more questions. <laughs> There's always more questions. Um, however, uh, there is or there are not currently any more questions for you. So I think we're going to end the seminar. But can I actually say one more thing? Because yep. I totally forgot. Of course, I have an acknowledgement slide that I <laughs> sure. want to mention. <laughs> A lot of people were involved in this project, most of them from Penny Chisholm's lab, uh, Raphael, who's a uh, 
who did most of the lab work. So he, he really tracked down the, tr the strains and uh, grew them under different conditions and got all the uh, rearrangement figured out. Markus Ankenbrand who helped me a lot with the genomic analysis. Um, Steve Biller, who now has his own lab, um, he did most of the vesicle work, the, getting the samples and I analyzed them later on. Ramunas and his lab at Bigelow who did all the single cell uh, sequencing for us. Um, and then um, the, uh, at the Long's lab uh, and Matt Sullivan's lab, they with those we collaborated to get all the viral data to match up our elements with the viral fraction metagenomes. And of course, we had a lot of funding from different agencies. Um, so yeah, thank you to everybody. Yeah, and thank you again. That was a wonderful talk. And um, uh, of course, I look forward to hearing more about this uh, Proclarcaucus system. It's just amazing what they can do. So, um, well, that concludes the seminar for today. Uh, there is another seminar scheduled for July 9th. So check back again um, next week and uh, we can, we can uh, all get together and listen to some more wonderful science. So thanks again, Thomas. And um, thank you all for watching. Okay. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. bye.